Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Audrey Leon. I'm an editor with Asian Oil and Gas Magazine. Uh, today, our webinar, SCADA Security Responses to Modern Cyber Attacks in Oil and Gas, will be presented by Andrew Ginter. He's the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. Um, he is, for 25 years, he has led the development of SCADA IT and OT middleware and SCADA security products. He holds patents for IT and OT middleware and SCADA security technologies. Andrew represents Waterfall to standard bodies and writes and speaks frequently on SCADA security topics. Andrew is the co-chair of the ISA SP-99WG1 and he is the author of SCADA Security, What's Broken and How to Fix It. He holds degrees in applied mathematics and computer science as well as CISSP, ISP and ITCP credentials. Thank, uh, so without further ado, I will open the webinar to Andrew. Thank you, Audrey, and hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to chat with you your morning. Um, as Audrey said, I'm with Waterfall Security Solutions. Waterfall is focused on protecting the safety and the reliability of industrial control systems through cybersecurity. Um, so to begin, you know, our topic is, uh, you know, modern attacks and, and how to respond to them. Um, what does a modern attack look like? Here's what it looks like. Now, when I talk about modern attacks, the oldest attacks around are things like viruses and password guessing. These are not the attacks that most people are worried about today. Antivirus does a not half bad job of keeping viruses out. Uh, and we've long since learned to use passwords and, and encryption. It is these modern targeted attacks that everyone is talking about. How do they work? Um, they are operating by remote control. Um, they piggyback on legitimate remote sessions like remote desktop or virtual private networks. Um, they generally use phishing attacks to steal the usernames and the passwords that are needed to log in remotely. Once they're inside, they look around, and sometimes they get lucky. They find additional passwords. Sometimes they use something called a pass-the-hash attack, which reuses existing credentials on machines they've compromised. They use these credentials to sometimes, you know, if they can compromise a domain controller, they will create their own accounts create their own passwords, log in now as their own users, able to do whatever they want. What they want to do is execute more code. So they will plant some of their malware called remote access trojans um, on machines. These remote access trojans are generally low volume. There's only a few hundred of them deployed in the world, which means there are no antivirus signatures for them. Um, these remote access trojans let these attackers do something called pivoting, which is um, moving from one compromised machine to another, deeper into a network, through firewalls, into to deeper targets, ultimately reaching targets that cannot themselves reach out to the internet, but are reachable through an indirect path from the internet. These modern attacks have figured out how to routinely defeat all of the IT type protections. We use to protect IT networks and sometimes control system networks. Um, here's an example. This happened uh, the end of 2015. And now it's in the electric sector, but it's using all of these same techniques to breach a control system. In the Ukraine, uh, it was widely accused that the Russians had uh, launched this attack and succeeded in turning off the lights, the electricity to some uh, 225,000 people. Uh, a post-attack investigation revealed that spear phishing produced account names and passwords for remote access technicians. These attackers then logged in using those passwords and those account names, looked around, they found more credentials, they found access ultimately to the SCADA, the control system, human machine interface, the operator interface that was operating the power grid. They watched that interface for a while, learned how it worked, and eventually took it over 
and over a period of half an hour, systematically went through one screen after another, turning the lights out. At the same time, an accomplice logged into the substations that uh, were operating these switches and erased the hard drives in those substations so that even when the operators regained control, they could no longer remotely turn the lights back on. At the same time, the investigation revealed that the Black Energy Remote Access Trojan had been deployed in these distribution systems. This is a, a malware, a tool that provides remote control to attackers. But as far as the investigation could determine, that Remote Access Trojan was never used. Or if it was used, it was certainly not needed. The spear phishing produced all of the credentials that were needed to turn the lights out. The bottom line here is that these attackers, which were assumed to be Russians because of the, the, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict that was going on at the time, these attackers were pretty much sipping coffee in another country while they were attacking the control systems in the Ukraine. Now, a lot of people thinking about this, they might immediately say, you know, we should not have used just a password and an account name on the VPN in that control system. They should have used two-factor authentication, an RSA dongle, uh, something that randomly generates passwords. You have to have this thing in your hand in order to log in. But this is too limited a way of looking at it. This is like saying the, the, the only use we should make of a penetration test is to put a Band-Aid over whatever attack path the penetration tester used to successfully break into the system. This is not what we use penetration tests for. If a pen test succeeds, it shows us that our security system is flawed. The proper use for a pen test is to uh, persuade people to release funding to fix the problem fundamentally. If, for example, the Ukraine uh, distribution systems had uh, used two-factor authentication, something like Black Energy would still have allowed this attack to take place exactly this way. The problem here is not stolen passwords. The problem here is two-way communication with the Internet. The bad guys can use two-way communication with the internet to issue commands and receive responses and remotely operate equipment, not just inside the IT network, but ultimately in control system networks. We need to defeat this kind of attack much more reliably. In the Ukraine investigation, the uh, American Department of Homeland Security's Industrial Control System Emergency Response Team was called over to help with the investigation. They recommended a number of things that could help. They said, patch everything. Bring it up to the latest security updates. The problem is that there's no evidence that any known vulnerabilities were used in the attack. So patching would not have helped. They said, have contingency plans, manual operations. Well, this is what the Ukraine folks had. When the lights went out, they scrambled people into trucks to drive out to the substations and physically turn the power back on, physically throw the switches. Um, they recommended whitelisting. But, but, and, and if I may, you know, that's the right thing to do, but it, it took hours. It was eight hours before the lights were back on throughout the, the affected area. Um, Whitelisting uh, is something that allows only permitted executables to run. It's supposed to be able to defeat even zero-day attacks. The problem is it can be defeated as well. There's well-known ways to get around whitelisting. They suggested isolate uh, the control system networks from the Internet. Don't connect control systems to Internet. But the problem is that everyone connects the control system to a network, to another network, to another network that ultimately goes out to the IT network and out to the Internet. There's an indirect path to most control systems in the world. This is a problem. Sophisticated attacks pivot through those intermediate networks and take over the control systems. 
the mitigations recommended unidirectional gateways, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the problem is attacks can still enter networks on USB drives or on laptops, even if gateways are in place. And so this set of mitigations seems very confusing. We need a different way to look at the problem. Here's some questions to ask. How can a control system change from a good, clean, uncompromised state to a compromised state? How do we compromise a control system? The only way to do that is for an attack to cross a perimeter. Important control systems, important physical sites always have gates and fences and guards. There's always a physical perimeter. And wherever there's a physical perimeter, there's a network perimeter. In order to change from an uncompromised to a compromised state, an attack has to breach the perimeter. What is an attack? All attacks are information. Even an insider attack is a password in the head of an attacker physically walking through perimeter into the, the excuse me, into the site and, and acting with malicious intent. That's information being carried in someone's brain. All attacks are information. And every piece of information could be an attack. And so the right way to look at defending control systems is how do we control the movement of information? That should be our primary defensive question. Our secondary question we can look at is if we're compromised, how do we limit the impact of that compromise. But fundamentally, we start with how do we control the movement of information? Um, the, uh, this focus on the perimeter is running against standard IT security trends. For the last many years, maybe the 15, you know, 12, 15 years, the IT gurus have been saying the perimeter is dead. Carrying cell phones into corporate networks, you know, where's the firewall around the cell phone? Um, how much corporate information is on the cell phone? People have USB drives everywhere. They have laptops everywhere. The perimeter, the IT gurus are telling, is mean, telling us is meaningless. Is this, is this true, though? Would anyone put our safety systems for a refinery or a pipeline? Would anyone put our safety systems on the internet where anyone could attack them all day long? Even if we had state-of-the-art systems, not state-of-the-practice systems, state-of-the-art systems with every security mechanism anyone's ever invented, nobody would do that. It doesn't matter how secure we think something is. There's always a risk of a vulnerability that we have not found yet, or worse, a stolen password. In the IT world, we might be able to find the affected equipment, erase it, and restore it from backup. Catalytic crackers, damaged turbines, human lives cannot be restored from backup. Control systems are different. There's always a physical perimeter around our most important systems. We do not let people walk up and touch them. And wherever there's a physical perimeter, there is a cyber perimeter. To compromise a control system, attacks have to cross a perimeter. So what do we do to control the flow of information across a perimeter? A great many sites are starting to use unidirectional security gateways, at least one layer of them. And I'll show you what that means in a moment. The gateways are a combination of hardware and software. Everything inside the, the red area here in the center is a gateway. Um, a transmit module has a fiber optic laser, a sender in it, a transmitter. The transmit module, though, has no receiver. It has only a transmitter. The receive module has a receiver, a photocell, but no laser. The receive module is physically not able to send any signal out back to the transmit module. And there's a short 
fiber optic cable, usually about half a meter long, connecting the transmit module to the receive module. Together, this system lets us move information from an industrial network out to the world, and nothing at all can get back in through the system here. There's physically no way to send any signal back. The transmitter cannot even tell if the receiver has power. The hardware makes this secure. The software moves the data. The software runs on regular computers, comes on a CD. The software makes copies of servers. You know, for the, for the control system people who are listening, this database server might be a, a Pi historian, or it might be an I historian. For the, the IT people in the audience, this might be an Oracle database or a SQL server. It's a database. Some kind of database is generally used uh, as the focus of IT OT integration. All of the data we want to publish into the IT network tends to be aggregated in a database. Whatever this database is, if it's Oracle on the inside, we need another Oracle on the outside. If it's Pi on the inside, we need a Pi on the outside. There's two databases here, one on the inside and one on the outside. The unidirectional gateway software logs into the database as a normal user reads all of the data and pushes the data out through the one-way hardware. On the receiving side, the gateway software logs into the outside database with a normal username and password and inserts all of the data into the outside database. The outside database is now a copy, a replica of the inside database. Anyone who wants the data on the outside can ask the replica for the data and get the same answer as the live system would have provided. Unidirectional gateway software works very hard to make sure that the replica is a faithful, accurate replica of the live server. Everyone on the outside gets their data from the replica and has no idea they're working with a replica until something bad happens, until a hacker gets in here and encrypts the hard drive, or a virus gets in here and erases the hard drive. Well, when this happens, IT has to fix the replica. We erase the replica. We put you know, the operating system back on. We restore from backups. It takes three hours. The whole time, chaos has consumed the IT network, and all of the IT users are up in arms. The refinery keeps working. The pipeline keeps flowing. The offshore platform keeps working. The industrial network has no idea that chaos has consumed the corporate network because there's physically no way to send any hint of that chaos back into the industrial network. This is what people are doing to address these modern risks. Um, what this means, though, is that because the software logs in with a username and a password and really understands the nature of the database it's connecting to, it means we, diff we, we need a lot of connectors. We need different connectors for every piece of industrial software that we might want to replicate out to an IT network. And so there's a lot of connectors available, and new ones are coming available every month. So it all works. Um, so we've been talking about the unidirectional gateways. The, the gateways really, though, are the flagship, are the, the uh, sort of the head end of a whole family of unidirectional technologies that are available for use to protect industrial control system networks. The gateways make copies of servers in one direction. And I'll be using these icons on the next few slides to talk about applications of the gateways in oil and gas industries. So when we see this arrow, it means basically what we saw up here. It means a computer running software, a transmit module, a receive module, and a computer running more software. All of that is in this arrow. There is another kind of technology called the FLIP. The FLIP is a kind of unidirectional gateway. The FLIP 
can send information only in one direction at a time, but it can flip over, usually on a schedule. And so what the flip does is it lets us be one way out or one way in, but never both. How would we use this? Well, let's say we have a refinery and we are sending antivirus updates into the refinery, let's say twice a day. And I don't know, um, production orders are going into the refinery as well from an SAP system on the IT network. The flip would let us replicate databases like historians or relational databases out to the world all day long. But let's say for 10 minutes at 2 in the morning and at 2 in the afternoon, the flip is programmed to reverse and allow antivirus signatures in, allow, you know, pull the, the, uh, the batch recipes in from SAP, and after 10 minutes, reverse again. The flip can only allow one-way traffic. It replicates databases out, and it replicates antivirus in. There is no two-way traffic. It's not possible to do a remote desktop session or a secure, cell a secure shell session pardon my stumbling here, or um, you know, a Citrix session through the flip. The flip is never two-way. It's only one way uh, at, at intervals. If we need two-way communications, for example, some kinds of uh, petrochemical plants might need continuous optimization, continuous inputs from the outside world, um, there is the possibility of such inputs through an inbound outbound gateway. This is two unidirectional gateways set up in parallel. The dashed line in between means the gateways cannot see each other. They generally replicate one kind of server on the way out, like a historian or a relational database, and they'll replicate a different kind of server on the way in. For example, the, uh, the process orders from SAP or some kind of optimization instructions in maybe an XML file from an optimization program of some sort. Maybe a program that optimizes the electrical power consumption of equipment at the plant, scheduling the equipment so that peak loads do not exceed uh, a certain limit and trigger an increase in electricity prices. So these are all based on the gateways. Application data control is a software component that's an add-on to the gateways. Um, application data control basically lets us create policies saying this data is allowed to move, that data is not allowed to move. These values are reasonable values. Those values are not. Um, you know, if we have a pipeline whose maximum flow rate is, um, you know, I don't know, a thousand cubic meters per minute, and a value comes through, a command comes through saying, uh, increase the flow rate to 100,000 cubic meters per minute. Um, application data control can look at those values and say, A, that's a, not a reasonable value. Either drop it or change it. Or B, uh, you know, raise an alarm. This value should never have come through. We're under attack. So there's a whole family of technologies here that um, use unidirectional communications to meet different kinds of communications requirements. All of these technologies reliably defeat remote control. So who are we seeing use this? How are we seeing use it? Well, a lot of uh, users, of end users, are not willing to share their names because they don't want the bad guys to learn precisely what kind of protections are in place. Um, this is one example, or sorry, one, one exception to that rule. Uh, Noble Energy has kindly allowed uh, Waterfall to use their name as an example of using this kind of strong perimeter protection in their offshore platforms. So Noble's gone public with their use of Waterfall. Um, they have a control system network on each of their off offshore platforms, and they have an IT network on the platform 
as well. On their platforms, they use Wonderware. The, the process control system is Wonderware. They also have GE turbines, gas turbines, to provide electricity for the platform. These platforms are big things. Um, they've deployed unidirectional gateways, outbound only. Nothing comes back in. Uh, and what they replicate is OPC servers so that their Pi historian can pull data from the replica OPC servers. They replicate files. They do this because their people on the platform, on the control systems, routinely need to send files out to the world. It might be debug files. It might be ad hoc reports. Um, there's all sorts of files that are produced through routine operations on the, the plant network that need to go out to the world. So the gateways replicate a file server. Any file that's dropped on the server on the plant network magically shows up on the server on the IT network where IT users can pull those files and analyze them and do what they need with them. Um, the GEI historian, this is a kind of historian database that tracks the activity of the uh, gas, the natural gas turbines. The GEI historian data goes all the way out to the central General Electric monitoring site where they monitor their equipment for vibrations and for heat anomalies so that they can carry out predictive maintenance um, and predict when failures are going to occur so that they can be corrected before there's any failure of the equipment. And remote screen view lets the same GE control centers see what's happening inside the control system and supervise corrective action to the, the turbines if a vibration problem starts, if uh, any kind of heat anomaly shows up. The turbines are rotating equipment. They wear. All rotating equipment wears. The symptom of wear is vibration. Vibration is the enemy of all rotating equipment. The eye historian replication lets the central GE experts and expert systems monitor the turbines. Remote screen view lets them adjust the turbines remotely by talking to someone at the plant, or sorry, at the, uh, the, uh, the platform and having that person move the mouse and make the changes while the GE person is watching the screen through the one-way unidirectional gateway. Nothing ever gets back in. On the IT network, um, there is a PI database. It's the one pulling data from OPC, and that database is synchronized with an enterprise-wide database for all of the platforms across a satellite, a, a satellite link. Noble is on record saying, this is now our standard deployment model for all offshore platforms. Something else Noble is doing, and they're on record for this, is removable media. We can, you know, the, the unidirectional gateways address the flow of information and so the flow of potential attacks through the network perimeter. There's also the physical perimeter that has to be considered. Anyone who can walk past the physical perimeter, the guards and the, the, the gates on the platform into the control system area um, could be carrying an attack in their pocket. They could be carrying a cell phone. They could be carrying uh, USB drives. And so there's a number of systems that are used to address that risk, and in particular to inspect information coming into the control system on removable media. So for example, um, there is something called device control. This is a kind of software that can be installed on computers. And if someone plugs a cell phone in or plugs a USB drive in, an error message pops up saying, you know, you're not allowed to do that. And a message is logged, and the user is logged. And we can see who is using these devices incorrectly. And of course, the software prevents the device from mounting and prevents any information being pulled off the device. When we need information to flow into the system, um, these devices are plugged into a cleansing station at the, uh, at the physical perimeter. When you walk through security, there's a cleansing station there. If we need files to come into the system, plug the USB drive 
into the, the computer. It scans the USB drive with you know, four or eight or ten antivirus engines and copies clean files to new media or more likely to a file server inside the network where those files can be accessed. The physical devices are left behind. Laptops are the same thing. Noble reports that um, if someone needs to visit the control system, if a vendor needs to come out with a laptop, they have to make arrangements in a, ahead of time. There has to be a helicopter schedule. So they know if someone's coming out, they can say, what are you bringing with you? Or you're bringing a laptop. What software is on the laptop? Explain this to me. Um, and so the, uh, what Noble does is buys a brand new laptop, makes sure it's clean, installs the software on it, and has that laptop ready when the visitor comes through security. The visitor's laptop is left behind. The new known clean laptop is used inside the control system. So this is how we control the risk of physically carrying attacks into the system. Noble reports that they are able to eliminate almost all incoming laptops and incoming USB drives this way. Almost nothing needs to get back in to this control system. So another example, um, the same technology can be used in refineries. I can't name names here, but I can say that people are using this technology in refineries. Um, the main ITOT interface tends to be a flip because there tend to be antivirus updates, there tend to be uh, production orders that need to come from the IT network periodically back into the operations network. And again, what goes out is remote screen view, databases, files, um, IT stuff often as well. We have to keep the security operations center happy. We send syslog out so that the, uh, the security people can see all of the logs from all the devices in the plant. Um, we send out SNMP traps so that the network operations center on the IT network can see all of the activity of all the network activity uh, in the plant. Um, we also have a, a pure unidirectional gateway going out to the vendors. This might be the, the, uh, the equivalent of the iHistorian. Anything that the remote vendor, any remote vendor wants to monitor, they can monitor through the gateway. If they need to do any adjustment remotely, again, it can come in through remote screen view. So the architecture here, a, you know, a traditional IT style defensive architecture, defense in depth art, has the most important networks on the bottom here, the ones that are physically controlling the process, and has the source of threat, the risk at the top here, the internet, and has layer after layer of firewall and other defenses all the way down. When people deploy unidirectional gateways and these physical defenses to defend a control system network, they generally choose one layer of firewalls and replace them with the unidirectional gateways and with the physical protections for removable devices and laptops. Um, they replace that one layer with this strong perimeter focus protection. And this breaks the chain of infection the chain of remote control from the outside world. It's not possible anymore to operate these plant systems by remote control. It's no longer possible to sip coffee on another continent misoperating our physical process. We can do the same thing in pipelines. In pipelines, though, the situation is a little bit different. The any wide area network is generally seen by SCADA people as a source of risk. And in a pipeline, there's two wide area networks. One is the IT network and the internet above it. The other is the wide area network that's used to operate the pipeline. Both are sources of risk. So the ITOT interface from the SCADA site out to the IT system and out to the, the internet, 
that can be a unidirectional gateway. Going from the SCADA site to the WAN that controls the pipeline, and from the, that WAN back, you know, into the pumping and compressor stations, that's a different equation. We generally need to monitor continuously these remote stations, and we need to send controls out on a regular basis saying, open this valve, close that valve, you know, increase the, the, the pressure on the pipeline. And so what we need is an inbound-outbound gateway system. The inbound system at the SCADA site makes a copy of all of the control system components from all of the pumping and compressor stations in so that the SCADA site can interact with those replicas. The outbound system makes a copy of the SCADA site out so that all of these systems can interact with the replicas. And the same thing happens down here at the stations. The bottom line here is that by putting this layer of protection between the wide area network risk sources and the protected sites, we defeat these modern, powerful remote control attacks, as well as a whole host of you know, more conventional, simpler, virus-based and other you know, password-based attacks. As a rule, in a system like this, even if an enemy has stolen every password for every computer in the entire system, they still cannot go from the internet into the control system. They still cannot go from one pumping station into another, or from a pumping station that they've physically broken into, into the central site. It doesn't matter how much they have. It doesn't matter how clever they are. Remote control does not work anymore. What about other defenses? You know, Waterfall is not saying don't use these other defenses. The uh, Department of Homeland Security recommended for the Ukraine attack recommended whitelisting. It is a better fit for control systems than antivirus. Go ahead and use it wherever it makes sense. It doesn't work everywhere, but where it does work, go ahead and use it. Security updates, patching, they address known vulnerabilities, but they're expensive because their change. Every change is a threat to reliability. Every change might introduce a new problem. Security is supposed to improve reliability, not threaten reliability through constant change. And so security updates make sense on some kinds of control system components. They really don't make a lot of sense on other kinds. They're really expensive on these other kinds of components because of how much they have to be tested. They have to be tested enormously to make sure that the new updated system is going to be as reliable as the old one. It might be more secure than the old one, but if it's not as reliable, then the security hasn't bought us anything. Security is supposed to buy us reliability. Intrusion detection is worse. It's very expensive to run an intrusion detection system. Why? Because we need people. We need eyes on glass. We need people watching the intrusion detection system or it's worthless. We need to uh, investigate every alarm the intrusion detection system throws up or it's worthless. If we're going to ignore half the alarms, how do we know that the alarms we're ignoring are not real attacks? We cannot tell the difference between false alarms and real alarms unless we investigate them. So intrusion detection is very costly. So you know, we're saying go ahead and use all of these other systems. But a lot of these systems are costly and sometimes they impair reliability and even safety instead of enhance it. So what we're saying is, once we have the primary perimeter defenses in place, go ahead and deploy as many of these secondary defenses as make sense on the equipment where it makes sense. But we no longer need to deploy these everywhere the way we must in IT systems in order to have any hope of defending against these modern attacks. The primary defenses, the perimeter defenses, defend us against remote control. These secondary defenses limit compromise if somehow some kind of attack leaks through our primary defenses. Um, it's not just waterfall saying this. In France, the new ANSI cybersecurity rules identify three classes of networks. Class one networks are 
expendable. They're not important to French society. The French rules say, go ahead, use IT-style protection on those class one networks. Class two networks are important to French society. The standards strongly recommend unidirectional gateways and strongly discourage any kind of remote access because, of course, that is the modern attack pattern. And class three networks, they, they give the example of a, a safety system for a refinery or a railway switching system. These are class three networks. If someone messes with class three networks, um, bad things happen very quickly. The standards forbid firewalls connecting class three networks to any less secure network. They forbid remote access to class three networks from any less secure networks. All they permit is unidirectional communications. Um, in the United States, um, is another example. The DHS has published uh, at the end of 2015 seven strategies to defend industrial control systems. Three of the seven strategies recommend unidirectional gateways. It's a bit of a confusing report. In each of the three of the, 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 the recommendations, they seem to have been written by different people because they use different terms to talk about the same thing. They say optical separation for one-way communication, or they say network segmentation with optical separation technology. It's all unidirectional gateways they're talking about. They need to, to standardize their terminology. Um, a few words about waterfall, if you'll indulge me. Um, waterfall produces unidirectional security gateways. We are the world's leader in this technology. We're headquartered in Israel. We have sales and operations offices uh, in the United States. Um, we're deployed worldwide in all critical infrastructure sectors. We're deployed throughout um, oil and gas. We're deployed in electric power. We're deployed in a lot of different sectors. The industry analysts, the ARC group, Cuppinger, Cole, Gartner, these kinds of people, Frost and Sullivan, they're all saying pretty much the same thing about waterfall. They're saying this technology, unidirectional gateways, this is an idea whose time has come. And these analysts are giving advice to their clients, saying to their clients, become familiar with this class of technology and use it wherever it's appropriate. And Waterfall also enjoys a lot of partnerships with industrial control system vendors. As a rule, this means our equipment has been in the vendor's lab, the vendor has put it through his paces, and the vendor is happy with customers connecting Waterfall equipment to the vendor's equipment in industrial control systems. So that was a lot of information. Um, nothing is ever completely secure. We can always be more secure, we can always be less secure. So the real question is, how high do we raise the bar for our enemies? Remote control attacks, the modern attack pattern, routinely defeats IT class defenses. All of the breaches we hear about every, every couple of days on the news is another remote control attack on an IT system. They defeat SCADA systems just as easily. Unidirectional gateways reliably defeat remote control attack. Directional gateways reliably protect network perimeters against remote control attacks. Physical perimeter protection is important as well. Perimeter protection, network and physical, should be our primary protections for industrial control systems. Secondary programs that we see the all through IT defenses, you know, security updates, encryption, etc. Um, these all still add some value, but we have to be careful how much we invest in these very expensive programs with strong primary protections in place, with strong perimeter protections in place, we can afford to scale, to control the investment in these costly secondary programs to reflect the amount of risk reduction they provide us. The bottom line is we can set the bar very high. We can set it so high so that it's impossible for an attacker on the other side of the planet to be attacking our critical infrastructure, our control systems, while sipping coffee. You know, 
I maintain that we can set the bar so high that even the most powerful of our enemies tear their hair out and curse the names of our SCADA security designers. That was a lot of information. Um, if you would like to, I mean, you've got an opportunity now to ask some questions. If you would like to explore any of these topics in greater depth, Waterfall does operate in Asia and on the Pacific Rim, and you know, give us a call. We'd be happy to arrange a visit and uh, explore these topics, uh, their topics, uh, in as much depth as you'd like. Um, Audrey, over to you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I do have a few questions, and um, if you, our audience would like to uh, send a few over to us as well, we'll add those to the mix. Um, our first question is, um, our IT team manages security for all of our, refiner, our refineries centrally. How do we do that with unidirectional gateways in the way? That's a good question. So the gateways defeat remote control. A lot of IT teams manage physical infrastructure, manage control systems by remote control. If and you know this is called ITOT integration. We have the same kinds of equipment, Windows systems and computers and you know, even relational databases, even Oracle. We have the same kinds of systems, the same kinds of software on our control system networks as we have on our IT networks. Why does it make sense to have two different teams and two different sets of, of you know, purchasing policies and two different sets of licensing policies? Why does it make sense to have two of all of these in every one of our businesses? And so for the last 20 years now, people have been bringing all of this stuff together. The same teams, the same people, the same skill sets, the same policies are being used to manage this kind of equipment all over the place. And so the question is, do we have to give up those benefits in order to get strong security? And the answer is no. There's a number of ways that people can do this. The most common that we see, and I don't have a slide on this, is something called an operations wide area network, an operations WAN. Everybody's familiar with an IT WAN. Everyone's familiar with every location in the company being connected into a wide area network that is the IT network. Well, what we see people doing is setting up at least one, but you know, depending on how big the organization is, there may be two, there may be 10 operation wide area networks linking similar kinds of physical operations, pipelines, refineries, offshore platforms. And they link these sites through a separate wide area network, separate connections, not shared with AIT, not shared with the internet, leased lines or you know, uh, leased circuits, um, connecting these sites into a central site where the IT people are. Now we've got, let's say, just two networks, a simple example, operations and IT. Um, someone at the IT site who wants to touch the operations network and manage it remotely and do things remotely has to badge into a secure area and sit down at equipment that is electrically, that's physically connected into the operations WAN. And this way they can manipulate the operations networks remotely. They can manage them remotely. They can apply patches remotely. They can, you know, They'd have to you know, bring in their antivirus on a USB and run it through the, the media cleansing system as they badge into the room, just like they would have to if they were visiting the platform. But they can do this, physically get into the room. You can get all of these benefits of centralization. But what it means is that every piece of the operations wide area network is protected the same way, physically, as any of the of the of the sites of the refineries or the pipelines with unidirectional gateways. There's never a firewall between any part of the operations WAN and any part of the IT network or any outside network. The entire operations WAN is protected unidirectionally, but internally, within the same level of trust, if you like, there can be remote access between systems. I hope that made sense. Um, if if people have that kind of question, you know, give us a give us a, a follow up call. You know, we can send you material on on how this works. 
Okay, another question uh, that we have, um, how can you be sure that data from operations gets through to IT systems? Um, well, it depends who we ask. Um, if we're asking from the point of view of the sender, if the, uh, you know, if we're saying the, uh, the, uh, the computer that is connected to the transmit module, let me uh, jump back here. There. If we're asking this computer on the left here, how can it tell if the data got through? The answer is it cannot. This computer is talking to the transmit module. The transmit module is sending blind. The transmit module has no idea if the receive module has power. Nothing gets back. The sending side cannot tell if the receiver got the data. On the receiving side, we can tell. Every piece of data, every, every message, everything that comes from the transmit module over um, has a sequence number. If we miss a sequence number, we know we missed a message. We can raise an alarm. We're on the outside here. This alarm can go out to the corporate network, can go out to cell phones, can go out to anything we need to. It, you know, there's heartbeats that come across by default every 30 seconds. If we miss a heartbeat, we know we're missing data. And so the sender cannot tell if the data made it through, but the receiver absolutely can tell. In practice, our customers tell us that, you know, the waterfall unidirectional gateways do not lose data. The only time they lose data is scheduled downtime. So if someone on the IT side schedules a reboot of this computer to apply Windows updates, and the computer's down for 10 minutes, well, it's going to lose data. And so when it comes back up, we know we've lost data. That's part of the scheduled downtime. And so what we do, depending on the application, but with databases, it's easy. You come over here. Part of the scheduled downtime is to schedule someone to touch the inside computer and press a button and resend the last couple hours data. And the receiver will fill in the gaps so that the replica server has no gaps in its history. You know, there's no duplicates either. Everything is in the database. It's a faithful, accurate copy of the industrial database once again. So again, we have uh, you know a lot of material on that. If people are interested, drop us a, a note, and, and we can send you some of that out. All right, thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Um, the Stux, uh, Stuxnet virus spread on USB keys and AV systems did not catch it. How would your approach deal with the next Stuxnet? Well, that's a tricky one. Um, Stuxnet did spread on USB keys, and antivirus systems were blind to it for a period of uh, between four months and a year, depending on how you count. And so even if there had been a physical cleansing system in place, and someone carried a USB key in and plugged it into that system, the antivirus scan of the stick would not have shown Stuxnet because there were no signatures for the worm back then. Um, there's been a lot of nonsense written about Stuxnet. Um, I would know. <laughs> I, I wrote a bunch of it. Um, the, you know, some of the nonsense um, said, hey, the, what we should do, because Stuxnet spreads on USB keys, what we should do is we should glue shut, physically put glue into all of our USB ports on our control system network and put a firewall in connecting the control system to IT. And this way, um, the only way into the network for any kind of data is through the firewall where we can see it moving. That was a fine idea. Lots of people went out and glued their USB ports shut. What they did not realize is that Stuxnet jumps through firewalls like they aren't there. Stuxnet piggybacks on legitimate connections through the firewalls. And just like there were no antivirus signatures, there were no intrusion detection signatures for Stuxnet either. And so the only way for the firewall thing to do us any good as a defensive measure is to uh, glue shut the ports on all of 
the laptops and computers on our IT network as well. Because if anybody plugged a Stuxnet into one of them, it's going to jump through the industrial firewall and take over the plant just as easily as it does coming off the USB stick in the plant. If there were gateways in place between the plant and the uh, between the plant and the IT network, nothing could get back in. If the gateways are in place, now gluing the USB sh B port shut does some good. Without the gateways in place, with just a firewall in place, Stuxnet jumps through uh, firewalls just as easily as it does across USB sticks. For proof of that, uh, if you're curious, Ginter, or sorry, Google uh, Ginter and Stuxnet. Uh, I've got a report out there how Stuxnet spreads back from 2010 that uh, that addresses this question. Shows how how Stuxnet jumps through firewalls. Um, any other questions there, Audrey? Um, actually, I'll, I'll open it up to the audience again. If you guys have any uh, questions, uh, we'll wait for a few seconds and take them. Uh, otherwise, I'd like to make an announcement. The, the PDF version of the slides is available as a handout currently, and uh, the webinar will be available on demand afterwards uh, if you missed any portion of today's webinar. Okay, uh, we did get one question. Uh, Andrew, how can our webinar participants uh, reach you? Uh, is there a preferred email? Sure. Uh, first name dot last name, Andrew dot Ginter. Hang on. Um, can you see that? First name, period, last name, at waterfall-security.com. A period on the front here and a dash in the middle. All right. Okay. That well, just, thank you. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that or, or email info at waterfall-security.com. It'll get to me eventually. All right. Well, if we have no other questions, thank you so much for your time, Andrew, and thank you so much to our audience for uh, participating with us. Um, and once again, uh, this has been a, a webinar sponsored by Asian Oil and Gas Ma Mag sorry, Asian Oil and Gas Magazine and Waterfall Security Solutions. Um, and if you have any questions, you can please reach us. Uh, our website is aogdigital.com. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey, and thank you to all of our listeners for uh, hanging in there with us. Thank you again.